Hi, this is Raphael Reed, and you're listening to the Sound Architect Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Sound Architect Podcast. I am your host, Sam Hughes, and as you just heard, today I am joined by composer Raphael Reed. Thanks for joining me today, Raphael. How are you? Oh, very, very good. Thanks for, for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. Now, before we talk about your recent score for the movie Crisis, I'd love to hear about your journey into music composition and how you began this journey. So I pretty much began doing music when I was about 12 years old with electric guitar. Had a band at the time. We're doing mostly uh, punk rock covers. Nice. Yeah, we did some gutter mouth, some uh, Blink-182 in the garage. My father was going crazy, but we're <laughs> going all around, you know, pretty heavy stuff. Around 14, I started making, creating my own music for this band. At this point, we were mostly in, into um, hardcore punk metal band. Eventually went all the way to black metal. So you see, we had like a Quebec City, where I'm born, is a city of metal. Oh man, I need to go to Quebec. Yeah, Metallica is still <laughs> very, very uh, well known there and people love it still a lot. So, so it's pretty much how I started, but around 19 years old, I felt like I needed to have a bit more uh, knowledge into music. So I went into classical guitar at a, what we call a Cégep. This is like a pre-university. So I did two years there. And, I've, and all the time I was always creating, had some bands on the side, we, we did some, uh, uh, some concourse, we, we went into Belgium at one point to play in front of 10,000 people, just oh, wow. to give you a broader aspect of how we were doing as a band. But I was studying classical guitar and I felt after the two years, well, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to go into university and study composition, not necessarily knowing what I was going to do with this. I knew I loved music film, but it wasn't my main focus. And the four years I did as a bachelor was mostly focused toward contemporary classical creation. So we're studying uh, people like Zanakis, Pierre Boulez, and trying to find our own voice into this world of crazy new kind of music. John Cage, for those who maybe know him, being one of them, obviously. Yes. And so pretty much all till my 25th years, uh, 25th birthday, I've been doing this, 19 to 25, having bands, stuff like this. And at 25, starting my professional career, mostly as a jingle maker, so advertisement, uh, but there was a, a couple of big ones. I did one for the Super Bowl. Oh, yeah, that's pretty big. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that was in 2012. I think I've heard of the Super Bowl, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, the, the, other, the other football, you know? <laughs> yeah, the, the other football where they, where they carry it and break all the rules. Yeah, that's it, that's it, exactly. <laughs> it's just because they call yourself football, I think, and you're a soccer, I know. There's kind of a controversy there. Anyway. Yeah, which is kind of weird considering as actually uses the feet more, but I'm not going to go into it. Like, <laughs> I, I agree with you guys. I'm not, I'm not with, the, with my friends. I'm in Canada, by the way, so I just, just so you guys know. So you politely so, stay out of it. Exactly. <laughs> Saying sorry every two minutes. <laughs> So, um, so, so yeah, so till at 25 started, like I said, advertisement. And I, when I was 20, at uh, 20, 2014, I had my big first gig, a big breakout, if I can say. And I did the music for the opening of the Champions Leagues, was uh, opening in Portugal in 2014. Oh, wow. So I think that there's like 100... 50 million people watching this probably when it's the final. So one or two, yeah, yeah. So it was like just, just, just to know this, you know, I'm losing my shit. I'm like, wow, this <laughs> is amazing. And watching the, the opening once everything was done was crazy. I can imagine. It must have been incredible. Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, and it was kind of an uh, Hollywood type of score. So in a way, it kind of introduced me to this kind of... Uh, uh, American style of making music. Mm. So, so yeah, so that was in 2014. And after I did a bunch of gigs, there was like, I did a circus in China. There was a hundred minutes of music I needed to do. Oh, wow. And the circus, so you know, there's like 8,000 people every day that goes there. It's China, right? Everything is yeah. huge there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, and did some movies, some documentary, and right now, well, the last gig, one of the last gig I did being Crisis, pretty, pretty much my biggest one to date. 
Yeah, and I'm very excited to talk to you about Crisis, actually. So this technically is your Hollywood debut, is that correct? Yep, it is. So that must feel pretty incredible. Oh, it is. And how does that land? Like, how do you finally go, oh, wow, this is my Hollywood debut? I didn't, did you think about that until it was actually released? It's, it's actually kind of funny. I've been, I think I've been pretty lucky in life. Everything, every time I'm kind of hoping for something, at least the occasion arise and it's up to me to get it. And something that's very unique in this case, as a French Canadian composer, I think I might be the only one who has had a Hollywood debut with such a big movie. Because usually you will think you need to go to LA, stuff like this. And I'm, I'm saying in Montreal, uh, I've, I've been there for 10 years now. And it's just kind of a unique chance that fell into my lap as many composer in Canada I was obviously not the only one. But uh, in a way, I got the upper hand and it's very, very rare for a French Canadian to get it. So yeah, of course, I'm super excited and happy about this. Yeah, and that's very interesting because like you say, most people assume, you know, to make it big in Hollywood, you've got to go to L.A. And, you know, you've got to network like crazy in L.A. and stay in L.A. for as long as you can until you get your big break. But that's not necessarily true, especially these days. Yeah. So how did this opportunity arise? So, so it's true that I think that those days, you think about a bunch of composer, Ildur Gunnidator being one of the the main one with the Joker, right? I, yeah. I think probably that people are interested to see what is how people compose outside of LA. So that's a big help. But what happened in this particular movie, which was very uh, lucky for me, is that they shoot the movie in Montreal. And the last composer that did uh, Nicola Jarecki's movie was uh, Cliff Martinez, Arbitrage. So it would have been normal for Jarecki to go back with Cliff. And he's a friend. They're both friends. Yeah. Where I got lucky, apparently it wasn't available. I'm not totally sure about this. Or maybe it was because hiring a composer in Canada for them, since they had shoot at it in Canada, probably gave them some uh, tax credit. Right. So okay. we've got to be honest. We've got to be honest about this. But I'm, I'm going to take their word saying that it wasn't available and I think it's a better story and keep it like this. <laughs> but, uh, but I know I know they wanted at least to see who w were the, the composer that could fit this project. And I know they tried a lot of people. They he met a lot of, of guys. So I think where I got the upper hand or maybe where I, I was a bit more lucky or maybe a bit more thoughtful it's hard to say but when i got the script after meeting the music supervisor which is first of all very lucky because you need to meet the good guy at a good moment first of all of course yeah <laughs> that's, that's the first thing and after he sends me the script talks to me about the movie i'm losing my mind i know it's the <laughs> old man it's nicola jerry i'm like wow i have a shot at this and i remember speaking to my girlfriend one year ago and that would be amazing to do a hollywood movie scar now the chance arise this is crazy so i get the script he tells me okay raf uh, take the weekend off but once uh, once you've read the script maybe send us some music you think might might work in the the movie but music you had done in the past you don't need to compose something it might be stuff you did on other movies just to see if the what you do overall might kind of work but we know it won't be perfect and i'm thinking i have two days i need to write music on what the script compels me yeah yeah and you you got to put everything on your uh, chance because i remember being in a composer meeting by afterwards and one of the guy that's a very well-known uh, composer here in his head he was already getting the gig yeah and i was like oh no that's that's not how you get this kind of gig so anyway so <laughs> so i do i do this big music blah 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 blah, blah. i'm not sure exactly if he's gonna like it because it's not typical hollywood but i knew that jerry he was with arbitrage, I had seen it, loved it, and I thought he had some thoughtful way of approaching the movie and music. So I knew I needed to be a bit out out of uh, the typical Hollywood score. So anyway, so I, I, I sent him those two songs. We meet, we have a great lunch, everything's going great. I know I'm just one of many composers. Six months later, he calls me, Raf, I have my first edit uh, that's there. Do you want to try making music for two scenes? See how it goes. I know there's other people now. Afterwards, I learned we were six composer at that time. And when I'm watching the full first edit, I see that the two first songs I had did with the script were on the temp music. Nice. So I knew in a way that was a good start. It's a very good sign, yeah. 
very good sign. And after, obviously, the two scenes I needed to do, gave everything I had there to, instead of doing two songs, I did four songs. And so anyway. I can imagine the the kind of excitement, but also stress exactly. for that moment as well. Like, you know, you're kind of like almost there. You're like on the precipice, right? I remember talking to my girlfriend about this. I was like, when we got, because it took so much time to get there that until I got it, at the beginning, I was fine with it. I was like, I need to give everything. It doesn't matter if I don't have it. I know in my heart that I don't, if I don't do this right now, I will regret it the, the rest of my life. Yeah. And when, and it took time because after the six month period, he called me, took another month after I've sent the music. Oh, so wow. I was just thinking about this. I had nothing else going on. I had just quit my kind of music supervisor job that I was doing to do this gig which i did not knew it i was gonna do oh man it was a good paying job and i was like what a risk i, was, I need to go all in so i need to quit so anyway yeah and so yeah the anxiety was really high one month later he calls <laughs> <can> me imagine <laughs> the music supervisor called me tell me raf you got the gig i'm like Whoa! <laughs> losing my shit <laughs> all this elation and weight just gone exactly. like Oh, I didn't quit my job for nothing. Like, <laughs> but but after it was another kind of anxiety because you need to do well. Yeah, you know every composer know that if there's something that can get out, it's the music before reshooting scene or stuff like this. And and com directors, good directors know the importance of music. So yeah, you need to be good. <laughs> well, that that's only the easy part, right? Getting the kind gig. of, and then now you got to deliver. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah kind of it's kind of true what you're saying and that's amazing and you mentioned uh cliff martinez before obviously known for things like drive and contagion and, and beyond um but he actually served as music advisor on the project as well didn't he yeah that was pretty amazing so that must have been incredible that was incredible because at the time after well maybe he didn't have time before but when i started composing the music now he had time so he had time to kind of give direction mostly on a macro level macro level but it was mostly almost weekly call that we were doing together. And I got to know a lot about uh, his way of thinking. It was interesting too to see how he was sometimes speaking with Nick because he has all these years of experience. So he knows how to tell that a music is good for the story of the film, right. which sometimes composer doesn't really think about. We're just doing good music, mm. but actually what does it serve the movie? And at one point, even I went to his place where I did some music for 10 days, which, which probably is the highlight of this whole journey, because the guy is just like a very generous guy, fun guy to be with and uh, very down to earth, like probably a lot of composer because we're used to to being at the service of somebody, I guess. Of course. Yeah. And it's such a fragile industry, I guess, that you never really want to get that ego in case you fall again, you know? Exactly. So I think it's so easy to not get the gig or you know, be passed over, so. And he told me the best of the composer loses gig. We all lose one gig at some point, so. Oh, 100%. It's so competitive. I can only imagine. But it's very interesting when somebody that, first of all, I'm a fan of Cliff Martinez and I respect him. So when you have somebody like him telling you this, it's like, give you a lot of perspective. So like, oh, okay, so that's just the game. So yeah, sometimes people say no, sometimes they say yes, and that's all right. So. So yeah, being around Cliff kind of opened my eyes on scoring some portion of it, definitely. But at even a more a global journey of even life. I don't know. He's, he's <laughs> getting of, very philosophical now. Yeah, yeah he, he's, he is kind of very, very philosophical. I mean, that makes sense, you know, in terms of storytelling through music and creativity in itself is a philosophical discussion. Yeah, and you know, something very interesting too that he told me, he told me, he doesn't care about doing a good soundtrack that will be released after and people will be like, wow, what beautiful music. He cares about doing the movie a service and making the movie better. And it's kind of something I, I know when you told me this, it wasn't, it was there in my mind, but not as strong as, as it is now. Now that I had those discussions with him, it's like, it's, it's true. In the end, even though if you just have one small pad, don't try to overthinking if that's what the story need, for example. Yeah, I think you're right. I think people get caught up in so many things that they forget what they're actually meant to do. And that sounds silly. And some of it is obvious, like, 
you're supposed to be doing the movie a service, right? As yeah, you say, exactly. but you get lost in so many different factors. Like, oh, I need to write good music. It needs to be memorable. It needs to stand out. I need to show how unique and amazing I am. And I need to just do an amazing job so that people will remember me and I get more gigs. But you know, you get caught up in all of that. And then you're like, actually, no, I meant to be helping the movie. Exactly. That's pretty much what I'm meant to be doing. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a very good resume. Everything you've said that is so true. But it's it's amazing how the simple stuff gets lost, right? Because we, as humans in general, we overcomplicate everything. Because of course, there's the stress of competition. There's everything else on top of it. And I think I think it's kind of a rookie mistake in a way because probably most of the upcoming star starting new composers stuff like this try to overdo it sometime. And yeah. And that's it. And some, and you don't want the music to overshadow what's actually happening in the movie, except if it's a superhero movie or whatever. Now you go all in and all big. But, for example, in the case of Crisis, there was a very fine line and a very subtle dance that I needed to do of not overdoing it because the actors are already giving a lot. Yeah, and you know, it'd be interesting to get your take considering this is you know technically your first debut into hollywood mm -hmm. how does it feel making that transition because this is something as you say a lot of new composers get lost in is defining their, themselves you know defining themselves carving a niche trying to stand out in the crowd and it's it's obviously easier to look back and be like oh yeah you need to focus on just supporting the movie and delivering the job but of course when you're early and you're new and you're fresh and everyone wants to do it as well you know you're surrounded by people who want to be composers and it's possibly one of the highest um highly competitive areas i would say composition because you you're basically always going to be freelance most of the time yeah so how do you kind of get that mentality and how do you retain it when you're trying not to be like oh my god i need the next gig otherwise i'm not going to make rent or you know oh my god what's going to happen if i don't get this gig or what's going to happen if i don't do well in this gig and how do you block all that out and just focus on that main directive well well to be honest first of all there's two things i can say to what you've just said that is i think is a very interesting point of view and the first one in my case i don't uh, i never had any problem of uh, thinking i might not get it i might lose a gig in a way i've been pretty lucky because pretty much all of the pitch I've done, pretty much all of the time I really wanted something, it happened. But I never felt as if my life depended on it. Obviously, if I would have lost the gig of crisis, it would have been devastating. But I knew in my heart, I was like, well, I knew that probably a year later or something like this, I would be like, I'm kind of an optimistic person, you know? Yeah. And I'll always do music, even though if nobody hires me, I can work something else and do music. I know it's just as part of my DNA and I accept it. And there's good stuff about it, bad stuff, because it's a pretty hard industry, like you said. But yeah. once I'm 37 now, and once you accept what you are, what you're doing, it's like... It's not, it's not about uh, if I'm going to get the next gig or stuff like this. I'm just going one thing at a time. But something, though, that I think is interesting is trying to stand out. I think maybe maybe in my case, for example, what was interesting about Crisis and what I've, one of the reasons why they went with me is because they thought I had a personality in my music mm. instead of the other composer were maybe too much trying to do the temp music. So maybe it's not because they didn't have a personality. Maybe it's because they heard the temp music, thought, well, he likes this, so I'm going to try to do the temp music, but differently, you know? And this is what Nick told me after he felt like I was the only one that had a music personality which is obviously not true because there's a lot of very good <laughs> composer in Canada but I'm, I'm gonna take it obviously but I so I think I think in my in my perspective it is important to have something that differentiate you from others I know for example with the score some people have made some connection in my music with Cliff Martinez which obviously I appreciate mm. but I but I think I have my own approach the own way I use the sound I knew there's kind of a, there's something you want to achieve when you're doing Hollywood music, but how could I do it my own way without overdoing it? This is kind of the fine balance. For example, in my case, the way to achieve it is, is mo I've mostly recorded all of my instruments instead of trying to use the VST that everybody are using. So I knew, well, maybe I'm going to use some uh, techniques that is already out there, but I'm using them with my own sound. So in a way, yeah. I'm guessing that it's kind of gives something fresh and new. 
and the first song I did, which is on the soundtrack called I'm a Federal Agent, which became the main theme of the movie. It was very interesting because where Nick put it in his stamp music was at a very important defining moment, which has a lot of darkness. But I, but for me, this song is kind of a Steve Reichy kind of electro music. Uh, in a sense, it has a minimalistic approach, but there's darkness and light. It's not clear what the emotion here is. So just starting with this, there was something interesting and unique that probably not a lot of people would have scored a scene where it's dark like this and yeah. it made kind of oh it kind of stood out and even cliff told me like this is the mother of all song this should be the main theme that is yours throughout so right there i had something unique fantastic and so that was it that was how the theme was born mm -hmm. when i got the script on the two days main team so that's why wow. that's why when you get the script never never underestimate making music before the movie because in a way Sometimes we struggle with temp music, but it's because the director is listening to the temp music over and over again. But when he has fresh here and just putting new image on music, if you have a good music that's already good to go, you might set the tone with this. Plus, the script can give you insights into the character's thoughts and feelings as well as what's happening on screen, right? So it gives you exactly. a deeper knowledge of what's actually going on more than the viewer will have. Yeah, exactly. And you're you're putting out your own perspective because after when they're doing the, the editing and everything, well, the movie can take maybe another direction you have thought, but it doesn't mean that what you did can't be used in a way to kind of give your own uh, your own taste in it. Yeah. And going back to that the weekend, those two days where you had the script, um, did they give you any sort of brief to go away with or did they literally just say, here's the script, show us what you got? Well, like I've said, they did not want to have music made for the script. They said, this is a script, read it. Uh, if you have music that you did in the past on other movies, so not uh, usable music, just send it to us. We'll see if it works and read the script before meeting Nick. That was the main idea is for me to know what I was going to speak with Nick when, I, when yeah. I meet him to see what kind of music he wanted. So, But before speaking with him, I had just fresh totally open mind so that that was very interesting to work uh, that way yeah and i'm curious as to your thoughts on this as well because i would say this is a fairly you know minimal risk to do but obviously when you're starting to work with uh directors and people like cliff martinez are involved they've asked you to do something but you have had that kind of intuition to be like no i'm not going to do what you asked I'm going to design something new because I know and feel that it will work better than anything I've already got. So in this case, I would say it's fairly safe because you've written a new piece for the script. It's not really going against the rules, but how do you know when is a good time to follow your instinct and be like, do you know what? I think you're going to like this more. Well, it, I think you've just said it in a way I, I kind of went safe, to be honest. Like I did follow my instinct, but it's like, it's just in this particular case, as you know, everybody's going to submit the same music they did in the past, sometime the music and music you did in the past, sometimes you might be lucky and it might work perfectly on a movie, but it's probably better than you do if you do it for the movie. So it kind of, kind of what a, a safe bet. And for me, I think like I've said prior, it was a way for me to uh, kind of maybe stand out. It was just me giving it all in and... Uh, and after we had a couple of time where I did follow my instinct, even though uh, the, the director was telling me, eh, I don't like this or stuff like this. And sometimes <laughs> it was a very, I really love Nick. Nick's a very uh, cool guy, but a lot of time that's it. Sometimes he likes uh, something and sometimes he doesn't. And that's all right. And that's all right. And sometimes I was like, well, I'm going to try. I'm going to try to follow my instinct. And we had time. We had six months. So sometimes it was paying off and sometimes no. But I think it's something that he appreciated that I I had ideas. I was showing them to him. And sometimes it was making him think like, oh, this is good. Yeah. And sometimes not. And that's okay. <laughs> it's a <laughs> collab collaboration. <laughs> it's how it is. Exactly. And in terms of that collaboration, communication is key. And it's something that is often overlooked uh, by people in creative fields as well. You know, not many people focus on learning how to communicate with directors or editors and such. How would you define the communicative relationship between you and a director and how you work 
in that professional capacity because obviously you don't want to just be a yes man for want of a better word but you also you don't want to argue too much or feel like you you don't want to act like you know better or you know it's it's really hard when you're a specialist and it's your expertise and you've got someone who isn't a musician for example yeah well i'm gonna give you two examples and it won't be i think like crisis was interesting because we're three involved mm. so you gotta remember sometime the first discussion i had what was with uh, cliff martinez which was always interesting and sometime i will defend my point sometime it was actually cliff and sometime cliff didn't like what i was doing and i would thought well you might be wrong because of this so I think it's important to always say what you think, but it's true that in the end, you got to be very humble and not and accept you're not in, on the driver's seat. So where I'm going to give you two example is one of the movies I did in 2018 called Wies Le Cavalier in Motion, which is a contemporary dancer, very well-known West Dance with David Bowie and others. Um, I remember the first music she's talking about thing going that is going very well in her life and the director wanted this the music to support this but me i was like this is the opening of the movie this dancer she's a punk she's she looked punk you know she has like a lot of drive the music needs to be uh, kind of and you know punk as we know <laughs> and i know <laughs> punk indeed <laughs> even though even though i use a lot of synth in this uh, but there were there was some guitar and big big ass kick drum uh, not kick drum but drums toms and um, and so at first I did this, the thing I felt, and it's exactly, he told me, well, I like it, it's very good, but uh, it feels it's a bit dark. I need something more light. I was like, all right. So I did something more light. I sent him and he's like, oh, this is perfect. And I tell him, you know what? I think with what you're doing right now, you're not going the right way. This is too sweet. She's not a sweet person. You, If you want people to remember your movie, you should go with the first song. Oh, wow. And he did. That's quite impressive, though, that you took the step to say all this. Yeah, but he had the other music. So you're showing them, you're showing him, look, this is what you want. We can go with this. And, and I'm fine. You always say this, obviously. You got to be fine with what he does. But I think you're making a mistake and you should go there. But... I just finished my last movie right now. We were actually mixing a session this morning. So uh, I'm doing the interview right after that. Oh, amazing. And and the same thing happened for the same opening. And the guy, it's a, a movie that's going to go pretty bad. I, won't, I can't say too much about it. But the beginning is pretty <laughs> I hope happy. I don't listen to this. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's in Montreal. It's in French. I think I think I'm pretty safe. So I th- and I think I can say this. So, uh, <laughs> but it's it's kind it's kind of a crazy thriller, psychological, a bit uh, a bit hard. But the whole beginning is pretty uh, hopeful, and so you want the the first opening song when they're doing like uh, in a pool, they're doing natation, natation, crawling. What do you call this? Yeah, Olympic. crawling. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So they're doing this kind of stuff, and you wanted to have like kind of an action but hopeful. Uh, song and at first I did with one of my friends actually who helped me on this song a crazy rap weird song with weird chord change and it's very you know it kind of portrays kind of harshness but it's it's the beginning it's slow motion there's no it could be a song a lot of stuff could work because the movie is still not started it's like the opening credit and stuff like this right okay so um and i thought this is the best and after he told me the same thing well no i don't want people to know it's gonna go uh, south and blah 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 all right so i did this more hopeful song more I give him and I tell him, I think you're wrong. The same thing. <laughs> I did the same, exact same thing. And he told me, no, I want the last song. All right. So that's it. So I, I don't think he's making a good choice. I think the other one is better. But in the end, is a director. What he's telling me makes sense. I mean, I can't argue with him. In a way, we are, as musicians, we, we like when it's a cool song. And mostly yeah. when there's no dialogue, a dialogue and, then, and everything. So it's kind of a video clip. You want a cool song, and I feel the other one is just less cool. But look, his point makes sense, and you gotta know when you win battle and when you lose some. And especially in a field that's very subjective, you know, everyone's going to interpret it differently. Exactly, yeah. he's probably right. I mean, in the end, he's the one who knows what he wants for his movie, and you should respect that. He's the captain. Yeah, exactly. But I think you're you're kind of towing the line correctly. You know, you've give, you've not denying him what he wants. You're giving him what he wants, but you're going, hey. But also, I think this could work better. Exactly. But you know, it's your it's your your driving man. Like, <laughs> so be being very humble and accepting. 
accepting uh, you're not the artistic uh, palladium or whatever you call this. Yeah. So going back to Crisis then, what would you say was your proudest moment throughout the project? Could be the proudest piece of music, could be the proudest moment throughout the production. The proudest moment is when I knew we were done. That's a great moment to be proud of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But having this conversation with Cliff saying, like, you did an amazing job, the, the director. When you have those people that you respect telling you that this, it could, if the movie, for example, the soundtrack is it's as perfect as it can be. Could have been other thing. Obviously, other thing would have been as good, but it's yeah. as perfect as it could be for this movie. When you have those people you respect telling you this, like, I remember looking at my girlfriend after speaking. I think first I had spoke with Cliff after with uh, Nicola, and I told her I did it. <laughs> like because it, in a way you're in the process, you're just doing, and obviously it, it well, kind for of so gave long me as well for six months, and it kind of gave me anxiety in the way that. Uh, Things were going good, and like I've said, I had a very good relation with Nicola. But in a way, I never took anything for granted. And I think yeah. maybe it's kind—it's of, kind of a—it's some fine people. There's sometimes people take things way too, more to much for granted, and for example, they get laid off after because well, no, it doesn't work because no, you gotta work your ass till the end. So to know that it was over and everything was accepted, even though probably three months prior to that, I was like, well. Half of the music is accepted. Obviously, I'm going all the way to the end. But, yeah. you know, you never know. Yeah, and uh, I can imagine that feeling when you finished as well. And uh, all I can think of is, so you, you even have Cliff Martinez there going, yes, you did a good job. You nailed it. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Where do you go from there? And how does that change your perspective? Because, and I'm not saying we all want this all the time, but you do have that innate need for a sense of approval and respect from someone in the field. And then someone has literally stamped and gone, you can do this. Yeah, yeah. And and so that must take a weight off, but also be like, oh, wow, now what? Well, I think, I think in a way, I'm kind of optimistic other project probably from Hollywood or maybe elsewhere will come in, but I, it's not, it's not a big issue for me. Like as long right now I did a movie here in Canada and I'm pretty happy about this one too. Like I've said, I'm always going to do music. So it's not, I'm not uh, pessimistic about the future in any shape or form, but what this gives me, uh, it's not a need to more approval. I mean, people, I know there, I have some friends who didn't like the soundtrack and that's fine. Yeah. I'm happy with what I did. And I think there's people, there's other people that wrote to me, said amazing job. You just mentioned Cliff Martinez. For me, it's the biggest stamp approval I can get. So for starting from there, whatever happens. But what it gave me, I think, I think now I realize I was a rookie, even though I had done music for 12 years by prior to cry uh, 11 years something like this after i think now i'm really an adult in this world and i have the confidence now too and i've done a documentary since crisis because i finished crisis in uh, december 2019 so i got approached by uh, some people in um, uh, Emira emirates arab united emirates 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 yeah so i did a movie for them did the movie for yan indian right here and now when I approach a movie, I have a broader way of looking in it. What's the story? How do I tell it? I have my confidence. I have some extra tool. I'm still discovering new tool because that's what drives me in music to try not to replicate what you did, but try to go further. Of course, yeah. So, so this is what it gave me, confidence and being an adult. <laughs> at 37 odd to say but uh, all, those, all those years well i'm still waiting to figure out when i'm the adult so you know it's great <laughs> you you'll know you'll know <laughs> i'll have that epiphany one day so on the flip side then what was the most challenging moment for you wow this is hard to say because in a way the whole the whole process was a challenge it was new way of approaching movie it was meeting new people keeping my shit together <laughs> <laughs> i think we all struggle with that every day you know <laughs> yeah staying focused like the the hours were different i mean i'm in montreal we have a three hours decay it's kind of weird to say but i go to bed pretty early i go to bed like at 10 p.m and so Nick calls me, it's like 7 p.m. for him. It's 10 p.m. here. So I'm like, oh, yeah, I need to work, you know, and that's all right. <laughs> it's, it's part of the process. So, yeah, I, I can't think of any particular moment. I think it's the whole stuff in, in a way that was a challenge. Yeah, I can imagine. 
So before I move on to sadly my last couple of questions of the podcast, could you tell me a bit more about how you came up with the soundtrack for Crisis and your creative process? I think like I've mentioned prior, there's something very authentic about the movie, like the way that Nicola treats his character, the way they're playing, it's very uh, subtle. I think it's very powerful performances. So I felt the music needed to reflect that. And uh, how I could achieve that, first of all, for Nick, it was very important for him that the music be subtle and doesn't overshadow the actors which I totally get. In this kind of movie where it's very psychological, you need to be careful. You don't go, you don't do a Hollywood score. Uh, I mean, orchestral Hollywood score, Marvel style. Doesn't work. Yeah. So it was very interesting the way that I needed to approach this. Well, very interesting. What I needed to do, I felt, was to pretty much create my own texture to use pretty much all real instruments. So even when you're hearing synth or uh, everything that sounds more... Uh, maybe computer based in a way they're all analog synth and i'm playing them i'm sometimes i'm a bit off grid sometimes i'm not using a grid uh, like a 82 bpm just playing and trying to figure out how to put it after so i think this kind of gave a lot of authentic feel to to the score i hope i hope and with the direction of nick which was very interesting is he, for him, everything is very important to score. Even sometimes the way somebody looks at some somebody, what she's saying, the way the music comes in, comes out. And following his note, I think it made the score evolve in a very organic way, which was something I hadn't really did before. So I'm pretty happy about this aspect of the score. Yeah, nice. That's very impressive to come up with such a unique set of your own textures and tools to use, basically. Yeah, for sure. So what else is uh, happening soon that you can actually tell us about? Always the big question. Can you tell us anything? Well, like I've mentioned, I have a movie coming out here in Montreal. Um, since it's in French, I'm not sure exactly where it's going to go. Uh, the director is pretty much well known here, Yann Indlian. His last movie, 154, was played pretty much uh, in a lot of places. So we'll see. But I, I did work on a small EP of five songs that I'm looking with a new label to release with them. So we'll see when it comes out. And two songs to, uh, to eventually take out as well. But at the moment, right now, I've been pretty much a week off, which is great. Week off, no work. Amazing. What we all dream of, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so sadly, drawing to my final question for you, but it can always be a bit of a doozy for some people. If you could go back in time and give your younger self some career advice, what would it be? Uh, it would be be careful of everybody that's around you. Like, it's very important to be uh, honest, but at the same time, nice to the people around you because you never know. You never know, and sometimes you might feel down and be a bit, uh, uh, how do you say, brusque, um, and be a bit intense. Oh, my girlfriend just told me the word is harsh. Yes, there you go. <laughs> Thank you to my bi beautiful bilingual girlfriend who's always there to help me with my English. So sometimes you can be harsh. You can be harsh to people, and uh, you should never be, because sometimes they're just uh, insecure, whatever, but it's, it's important. It's a small world. Everybody, everybody helps everybody if you help them. Amazing. I think that's a, a very good note to, to leave the podcast on as well. Now, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you today, Raphael. Thanks for joining me. And I hope you've enjoyed it just as much as I have. Actually, I did. It was a lot of fun. Thanks for your, thanks to you. Really happy to have done this. You're very welcome. And you're welcome back anytime. Amazing. Thanks again. And thanks, everybody, for listening. everyone this is sam thanks very much for listening to the sound architect podcast today i hope you enjoyed this episode if so there are many ways you can support the show which is incredibly appreciated obviously there's the financial way where you can support us on patreon which is patreon.com forward slash sound design uk however there are many other ways which also help such as liking subscribing reviewing commenting and sharing via whatever channel you listen on Thanks so much for your support already. It really is a work of passion for me, and I'd love to keep sharing the knowledge from all these talented and wonderful people. Thanks again, and catch you on the next episode.